welcome now to the cognitive enhancement session. Oh, somebody has come with cognitive enhancements. <laughs> Did you get one for me? <laughs> Damn. Okay, well, he'll win the argument. Um, but, he, but he won't be to pray, uh, we won't have to praise him, we'll have to praise uh, the manufacturers of that. All right. Um, so, welcome to the cognitive enhancement session. As I mentioned at the end of the previous session, I wanted to connect what Walter had said before I started my own session to this session. So one of the topics that came up for me in listening to that, uh, to Walter's paper, was the way in which the creation of these various devices might perhaps create obligations. So Walter mentioned uh, the question of, well, might people have an obligation to retain memory that might be relevant to a legal case? Now note, this is not the sort of question that we would even bother asking if not for the fact that some you know, wise guy created, or wise girl, created this device, right? So I think, well, hold on, so just because this person creates this device, I've now got a, an obligation to use it. There's something kind of queer about that. What, so you can just instantiate new obligations in me? Now, maybe that's the right thing to say. But I do kind of feel uh, like it's a topic worth discussing. Um, another issue that came up was the degree to which, and this came out especially in the discussion with Thomas, the degree to which if you just keep enhancing certain capacities, then likewise responsibility will keep getting enhanced. Now, why suppose that that mightn't be the case? Um, well, suppose, well, is it possible perhaps to have too much control? to keep enhancing your control further and further and further until you become actually inflexible. Um, now, I can see various objections to that, uh, to that even way of posing the question, but nevertheless, given that my interest in uh, discussing neurointerventions is indeed to a large part, in large part to try to shed light on the relationship between responsibility and mental capacity, uh, to the extent that we might have some reason to say, mm, maybe uh, it is not always going to be the case that by increasing the responsibility relevant mental capacities, people's responsibility will go up, or at least to the extent that we have certain reservations about saying this. Uh, I reckon perhaps that might be a reason to set aside uh, the claim, the capacitarian claim, that there is this relationship between responsibility in its eight senses, according to me, uh, and mental capacity. All right, that's all I really wanted to say about the connection between what Walter had said uh, and this session. So what I wanted to do in this session um, is to ask, to come back to some of the questions that Nita asked and also some other questions. So one question is, what may we do to ourselves, to our bodies? Um, you know, so... The way that she presented, Nita spoke a lot about uh, cognitive liberty in the sense of, hey, watch out, people might be listening into your thoughts and that sort of stuff, you know, so people might be listening into you. But she did also touch on, uh, on questions of, well, come on, don't I have the right to enhance myself? Isn't it my cognitive liberty? Um, one of the worries that I've talked about in some of my previous work, and especially um, in my more recent work with Emma Jane, have had to do with the fact that to the extent that me modifying my capacities, me modifying myself, might have an effect on others, so by me uh, enhancing myself, I suddenly make it harder for you to achieve the same results, or to look as good, because guess what, I've now had my two bottles of um, five-hour energy. Um, <laughs> Uh, that perhaps that is an unfair way of, you know, an unfair thing to do. Um, so, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just say a little bit about, about cognitive enhancement. I'll mention three different kinds of cognitive enhancement, just to make sure that, that we're not talking simply about Ritalin all the time. Uh, I'll then uh, voice again the cheating objection. Uh, in response to the cheating objection, I'll rehearse the... Uh, what are now my old arguments about the responsibility to enhance and the responsibility once enhanced. 
Then I'll revisit the question of the new normal. So that's where I sort of turn around and say, actually, rather than saying that, yes, we do have this responsibility to enhance ourselves, and sorry, guys, for talk, walking behind you, um, that perhaps we actually have a set of good reasons to disallow people from enhancing themselves. All right, so in regards to the cognitive enhancement, central nervous system stimulants, beta blockers, and devices like transcranial direct current stimulation. There are the three main things I want, to, I want to mention. So a lot of the time when cognitive enhancement gets discussed, uh, people tend to talk about medications like Adderall and, or Vyvanse, you know, so they're mixtures of amphetamine salts, uh, or Ritalin and Concerta, which are dopamine and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, uh, which tend to get prescribed for conditions like ADHD, um, but then which also tend to get uh, used off-label by some people uh, to, well, simply as central nervous system stimulants. Um, another medication that falls into this category uh, is Provigil or Alertec. I love the name, Alertec, um, which is modafinil. And that gets prescribed for narcolepsy, shift work, sleep disorder, excessive daytime, sleep, uh, daytime, daytime sleepiness. Now, so these are medications which, depending on who you listen to, or perhaps depending on who takes them, uh, can apparently have, uh, well, they certainly promote wakefulness. In some studies, it's suggested that you can actually retain things that you've learned a lot better. So uh, in some language learning uh, tasks, people who've taken modafinil, it is claimed that they have a 30% improvement in retention of the uh, words they've learned, which is quite amazing. And I'm really, I'm, I'm not scientifically qualified to be able to uh, assess the truth of these claims. But to the extent that I can trust that these articles have been well uh, refereed, it sounds like, hey, that's the sort of thing that maybe I would like to take. Now, uh, beta blockers. These are hardly nervous system stimulants. You know, so they're usually prescribed for hypertension, for arrhythmia. And what these things do is they interfere with your body's natural response to adrenaline and noradrenaline. So rather than ramping you up, they sort of calm you down. But note how it is that these things perform an enhancement function. The, way that they, the, the, well, the reason why they're enhancers in many ways is precisely because what they do is they dampen down certain responses which in certain contexts aren't very useful. You know, so the fight or flight reflex, which is what you get when your body starts uh, uh, generating adrenaline and noradrenaline, is not very good if what happens is, you know, you stand on stage in front of a whole bunch of people. Because if you do indeed uh, respond with a fight or flight reflex, well, you won't be able to give a talk, right? So perhaps taking a beta blocker can be an enhancer. And note the context sensitivity, right? That whether something is an enhancer or not, depends on the context. In this particular case, well, in some contexts, it might make sense to have a glass of alcohol because it'll be an, uh, an enhancer. In what context? In what sense? Well, in the sense that if what you're trying to do is to schmooze at a conference, you know, we've all had a nice day, and now we want to make sure that we can wax the lyrical, well, have a glass of wine, <sighs> you relax, and you can go up to Walter St. Armstrong and say, Walter, how do you do? Um, Great. Yeah, right, and you see, it works. Um, that's mine. No, actually it's water. <laughs> um, so beta blockers, not a certain central nervous system stimulant. Finally, there's devices like transcranial direct current stimulation. So these are uh, quite often nine volt powered devices. Um, you attach electrodes to certain part, parts of your scalp. You have the positive and the negative electrode. And depending on, well, if you, want, if you wish to stimulate, well, again, I'm just going to point to my head, ostensive definition. Suppose you want to stimulate this part of the brain that sits under there. Well, uh, there's the question of whether you would like to stimulate it using anodal or cathodal stimulation. If you, let's say that you want to stimulate it using anodal stimulation, then you would place your, the electrode roundabouts here, and you would place the cathodal electrode where? Well, hopefully somewhere in another place where you're not going to end up generating uh, cathodal stimulation. Sometimes, in some uh, cases, people spread the cathode in several places to make sure that you can get a much more focused uh, 
anodal stimulation and a defocus on the cathode. But there are many different techniques, and from what I understand, uh, uh, there's still a lot of research going on into whether or not this is a better technique, which technique is better, and so on and so forth. It also turns out that transcranial direct, transcranial direct current stimulation can have amazing effects, ranging from uh, analgesia to improving uh, motor uh, function learning, and again, language learning. So that some language learning studies suggest a similar 30% improvement in the retention of words learned in admittedly uh, kind of made up type of language learning scenarios. So it's not like you going to another country and uh, practicing a language in that manner. It's much more like, here, here's 20 words now, which seem to be gobbledygook. Try and remember these particular words. So they're not, um, what's the term? Ecologically valid scenarios, but nevertheless, they suggest, uh, there is the suggestion that you can increase your ability to memorize things by about 30%. Now, so they're the uh, methods. What do I want to say about them? As I mentioned in the introductory comments to this conference, at Duke University, some people claim, well, there is this standard uh, there is this um, document which says that if you use co uh, medications like Ritalin, like Modafinil, not for the purpose of treating uh, disorders on prescription, but rather for the purpose of enhancement, then you are con uh, committing some sort of academic you know, fraud. It's like copying another person's work and not attributing, not attributing it. That led some people to say that, hey, look, uh, Perhaps we should regulate this because, hey, it's unfair. It's unfair that some people should have access to this. And this unfairness, I guess, was the basis of the suggestion that uh, we should have a uh, clause which says that using cognitive enhancers is something that is on a par with uh, plagiarism. As Nita pointed out, uh, the actual motivation for doing this seemed to be very from the hip. And there wasn't that much uh, good quality discussion. Um, and indeed, that's precisely why we are now talking about this issue here. So that discussion has everything to do with saying, let's not allow people to take to use cognitive enhancers. Why? Because it's unfair. Um, it's unfair that some people should have access to it and others shouldn't. Um, of course, as one reply that you could get to that is to say, well, look, if the problem is that not everyone has access to it, well, then let's just pump this stuff into the water, right? Let's make sure everyone's enhanced, and then we'll be fine, or something of that sort, uh, if that's really the problem. Now, in a lot of my earlier work, what I did is to try and turn, uh, turn these arguments on their head and to say, look, if these medications or devices really are so helpful, Mightn't it not be the case that on certain occasions people have a duty to enhance themselves? So I've already gone through the scenario, but I'll go through it very quickly. Imagine that I'm a surgeon and I'm about to perform a very long operation, uh, maybe a heart lung transplant. This thing is going to go on for a long time. I know that as I, uh, as I do the surgery, I'm going to get increasingly more tired. I'll lose concentration. I shan't be able to uh, focus as well as I did initially. Um, but here's this medication that has relatively few side effects and it could ensure that I don't, or at least increase the possibility of a good outcome for the patient. What sort of good outcome? Uh, perhaps they won't die, like that sort of good outcome. If the risks or costs to me are sufficiently low and the benefits or the chance of there being a pretty good benefit are relatively high, then it's not totally out of the ordinary to say, actually, yes, Nicole, you might have a responsibility to take this cognitive enhancer. Why? Well, because look, you're not sacrificing very much, but look at how much another person stands to gain. Um, now, suppose we accept that argument and we say, right, so people have a responsibility to enhance themselves. What's next? The next argument that I've usually rehearsed is the idea that to the extent that responsibility tracks <coughs> mental capacity, bless you, to the extent that there is this, this relationship that the more of, a, of the right capacity you have, the greater your responsibility, would it be the case that the person who pops their Ritalin or the Modafinil uh, inadvertently acquires new responsibilities? After all, they are now like, you know, 
the brain-based or the mental version of Superman. And with great power comes great responsibility. It's now reasonable to expect more of them. Things that you know, we couldn't expect of another person to foresee the consequences of, you know, of some action, well, we can now expect that of them. Because after all, they have these great capacities of foresight, of prediction, or whatever else. So in the past, I've uh, argued that either from a legal standpoint, which is what I've been presenting to you right now, that we may find people will acquire, first of all, a resp responsibility to enhance themselves, and then greater responsibilities once they've enhanced themselves. But also, even if we don't uh, allow even if we don't go down the line of the law expecting people to enhance themselves, simply through mere competition we may find ourselves kind of coerced to have to take uh, enhancers. You know, so suppose that all these smart guys up here are you know, popping Ritalin, Modafinil, Adderall, um, Concerta, Vyvanse, all of them. Maybe, maybe all of them are, pumping all, uh, are using all of these medications at once, <laughs> as well as five-hour energy. Um, and I just can't keep up with them. You know, they keep, they keep writing papers at the same speed as Neil Levy writes papers. You know, <laughs> I mean, I can't even read them fast enough, let alone write them that fast. Um, if the reason why... If the reason why I would now find myself in this situation is because of the fact that, well, look, I'm simply not using this medication, I may find... I may just decide, that, look, it's not that I want to take this medication, but that I have to. Because otherwise, I'll be done out of a job. Um, I'll just look luckluster in comparison to these guys. Now, in the past, and this is the last part of the talk, in the past, I've sort of shrugged my shoulders and said, look, I guess that's how the world goes. You know, uh, If people decide to spend lots more time studying at night uh, and up the ante for me, well, I'll just have to work a bit harder too. You know, That's what competition is like. You know. Uh, stop complaining, Nicole. Um, but, you know, more recently, what I've started wondering about is whether perhaps I shouldn't pay a little bit more attention to my reservations about this. And the reservations go something like this. That I would... I think that something important would be lost if all of us found that through, because we allow ourselves to use cognitive enhancement medications in order to compete with one another, that after a while what we found is that simply to do our jobs, we now have to use these enhancers. What would be lost? Well, a certain kind of freedom. Freedom to decide whether I wish to use them. Um, I don't want my employer to say to me, Nicole, uh, like for instance when I travel abroad, I don't want uh, Mark Becker, the president of GSU, to say, Nicole, I expect you to take uh, the following medications to make sure that you're you know, really sharp when you present papers abroad. Or I expect you to take these medications after you've come back because guess what, you need to, ha you need to be able to teach uh, straight away and you have to be sharp so that your students learn. Um, I think that would be kind of crappy, a kind of crappy society to live in. Um, one where employers expect this sort of stuff from me. Now, Note that as long as a lot of these medications retain various bad side effects, like for instance an increased, you know, increasing people's blood pressure, it's unlikely for employers to have this expectation. But my worry here is that as technology advances, as the medications get better, as we figure out how to build the right transcranial direct current stimulation device, which doesn't have you know, any of the nasty, feature, uh, nasty side effects, what reasons will there be to say no um, to not using it? There won't be any bad side effects. And people will say, hey, why are you objecting to taking this thing that doesn't do anything bad to you? Surely you have no you know, reason to object to it. <coughs> well, my reason is that I don't want to be in the situation where somebody says, Nicole, you must drink that cup of coffee tomorrow. It's one thing for me to have, uh, to have the choice. Uh, to have that cup of coffee, it's quite another to be f expected, to be forced, uh, for this to be demanded of me. Um, more importantly, I think it's important for us to consider the social side effects of our actions. So if 
15, 20, 25, 30 years down the track. Um, our practice of right now taking cognitive enhancement medications results in a society in which every now, everyone now has to take them, that we no longer have uh, the right to say no. Um, I think that we should right now stand back for a second and say, hold on, is this the sort of society that I would like to live in in the future? Because this is, if this would indeed be an effect of my actions, of all of our collective actions right now, and all of us right now say, no, that wouldn't be something that any of us want to, uh, want to endorse, that none of us would want to be in this sort of society, then I think that right now we already have a reason, maybe not a, and, you know, a conclusive reason, but we at least have a reason to say, uh, no, you know, maybe we should regulate these, devi uh, these devices, these medications. And by regulation, I don't mean prohibit. But perhaps one way of regulating is to say something like this. Yes, it's fine for people, for surgeons, for instance, to take these medications before surgery once they've been made sufficiently good. But what we're not allowed to do is we're not allowed to start expecting them to perform at a better level. We're going to keep the level of, uh, you know, at which we expect people to perform, the duty of care, uh, to be the same. So we're not going to allow that, the standard, to be inflated merely because of the fact that people can perform better. Oh, Walter, are those enhancement tablets? Yes, I want one. Okay, so what have I done? Um, what I hope to have done is to have a, given you a little bit of an overview of what I mean by cognitive enhancement, of some of the reasons why I'm interested in it. Um, apart from wanting to write more papers. Um, uh, so in terms of saying, hey, I can see lots of really attractive reasons to take them, all the benefits, but at the same time to be worried about the fact that, yeah, but I don't, I don't want to find myself in a society that expects me to take this stuff. So I refer to it as the new normal, because the new norm is simply that you're expected to take uh, enhancers rather than this being something special, something that we say, hey, added bonus. All right, and with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to the panel for their comments. Great. Thank you. Yep, Walter. Uh, so, um, I'll, I'll come back to this, but I think a lot of the argument uh, that Nicole just gave depends on setting it up as a competitive situation. I mean, I hope that my writing better papers doesn't make you lose your job. Uh, because I hope that we'll be like writing papers together and we'll be cooperating and we'll be doing anthologies together and we'll each support each other so as to understand these things better. If it's a competitive situation and I do better, that might hurt you. But if it's not a competitive situation, all boats can rise, you know? And so, um, and so I want to put that on the table. I'll come back to it. But it seems to me a lot depends on whether you construe this as a competitive situation where one person doing better makes the other people worse. And it's just not clear to me uh, that that's the case. I certainly hope it's not the case at this conference because, you know, a lot of the papers I've heard have been great, but I didn't feel like, you know, my job was threatened. Uh, maybe because I have tenure, I don't know. Uh, so, but first we've got to get straight what we mean by enhancers. So, so these glasses right here, uh, they just bring my vision back to normal. Okay, but these babies, they're called reading glasses, and they make me actually able to read better than I could if I had 20-20 vision, because I'm able to actually read things closer up in smaller print and so on. So, I don't know if that counts as, a, I assume it's a cognitive enhancer, because it enables my cognitive abilities, but I don't think anybody, you know, it's interesting, you do need prescriptions for these. Um, but, um, but nonetheless, you know, they're generally allowed. Then, then there are these babies, I love these babies, uh, because what they do, uh, this is ibuprofen, and what it does is it stops my body aches. But look, a guy my age, it's pretty normal to have body aches, so I'm just trying to enhance my life by having few, fewer aches, and it's a cognitive enhancer because I don't get distracted by my knee hurting, and I'm able to focus on what I'm doing, uh, but that seems to be okay, I hope, right? Uh, and then uh, you can get 
these babies, which is Excedrin, it's got like 65 milligrams of caffeine and stops headaches. You know, that's perfectly fine. And these guys will put you to sleep at night, you know, because if you travel around the world now, it's, you know, you get jet lag and you gotta, you know, I took one of those last night. I was, worked pretty well. Uh, and then five hour energy, I mean, there's another one. I love these guys. Uh, I had one yesterday afternoon and I hope it didn't, you know, threaten your job. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and then there's coffee, you know, and everybody loves coffee. So, hmm, especially, anyway, I'll tell you my secret recipe later. But um, the point is, there's a whole bunch of enhancers that we do all the time that everybody just kind of takes for granted. And maybe you need prescriptions, uh, but you can get a prescription not by showing any great need, but just by saying, I want some reading glasses. Um, <coughs> And then there is the stuff in the, in the, in the but I'm not going to tell you what this is because we're getting recorded and so I don't want to admit. To, you know. <laughs> so this might be modafinil, it might be Ritalin, it might be, uh, you know, Adderall. Uh, I'm not specifying. But let's, um, let's talk as if it's ProVigil uh, or uh, modafinil. So then... Um, what kind of harm does it do? Well, let's assume also, just for the sake of argument, that it's not going to cause any medical harms to me. It can cause heart palpitations, but you can monitor those. If it starts giving you heart palpitation, you cut down on the dosage or quit and, and go to something else. And it might cause insomnia, but you know, then you stop it and you know, you make sure you only take it in the morning. Um, you know, so just like any other kind of thing, you you you've got to monitor how you're reacting to it. Uh, it's not clear to me that that's, you know, going to justify making it uh, something that requires a prescription uh, of that sort. Uh, it could be harm to others, but I honestly think that, you know, if I take the, the secret stuff in this jar, in this bottle, uh, I don't think that's going to threaten other people's jobs or um, hurt them. It might actually help them because my paper for the anthology that, that Nicole edits is going to be better, and so, uh, and so it might actually help. So why do, why do you take it then? I mean, it's, it's, it's not gonna harm you. Well, some people say, well, what's the problem is that it sets the wrong ideal, the wrong standard for life. This is Michael Sandel, right? You know, you're really, it's this quest for perfection and you wanna be perfect. Let me just make it clear right now. I don't wanna be perfect. Uh, that is not my goal, okay? I just wanna sleep less, right? Instead of, <laughs> instead of eight hours, I want four hours. And I wanna point out that four hours is actually Within the fairly normal range, they have a sleep clinic at Dartmouth. Some people came in, they'd only slept four hours a night all their lives. Bill Clinton, for example, is reported to only sleep four hours a night. There was one woman who only slept one hour a night from the day she was born. That just was her standard sleep pattern. Uh, and so I'm not even trying to get better than the best humans, much less perfect. I'm just trying to cut my sleep time by four hours so I can read over that paper one more time, so I can go through the slides for my talk one more time, so I can read that article that I wanted to read but didn't have time for. Um, it's not perfection uh, that's being said, uh, done. So then it comes down to Nicole's argument, which I think is a very interesting argument about the new normal. Uh, so let's assume the new normal is people who want to are taking uh, Provigil or Modafinil, and they're sleeping four hours instead of eight hours, so they're getting more done, okay? Now, I think uh, it matters from context to context what's going on. If it's a competitive situation, right, like in, you know, sports or, um, I don't know, um, maybe education, you're fighting against other students to get to medical school, you know, you've got to do better on that chemistry test or that physics test, and the other people aren't gonna get into the medical school if they don't take it as well. There can be some pressure there. It's not, however, coercion, and I wanna point that out because there are other ways to enhance yourself too, like by better exercise, better diet, and so on. Uh, you don't have to take the drugs, it's just cheaper and easier, right? Uh, there are other ways to enhance where you can be competitive getting into medical school and so on. Uh, so I'm not, I don't think it counts as really being coerced, but I do grant there's going to be a lot of pressure there. And so what happens when students at our university start sleeping four hours less? Well, look, I'm a professor. If, if I know I can give them two extra hours of reading and you know, some extra writing assignments and stuff, I might start piling on the work and then 
they're really, it's not clear that they're better off from a competitive point of view, but suppose that they spend two more hours studying and two more hours with their friends. What's the problem? They learn more, they had more time with their friends, they just slept less. Uh, I don't see what the fear is of this new normal if that's the situation that occurs. And of course you can say, no, 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 it's going to happen this way and that way, but that's just, I mean, it seems to me that's a fear mongering. That's a slippery slope that says maybe that'll happen and we better not go down that road because it might not happen, but almost any innovation is going to be subject to that kind of opposition. And what you really need is some argument that yes, that will happen. Instead of just four hours less sleep, two hours more time on homework, two hours more with your friends. Uh, that sounds pretty good um, so far. Uh, and then we shift over to a different context, the doctors. Okay, so maybe the hospital is gonna say, you know, you're negligent, you're not doing common standards of care in your practice if you're a surgeon, you're 20 hours into your shift uh, and you don't take one of these enhancers to wake you up and make you do better. Well, you just tell me. Okay, you got surgeon A, they're 20 hours into their shift without the enhancer. Surgeon B, 20 hours into their shift with the enhancer. Who do you want to do the operation on you? I'm going for the enhancer, baby. No question about it, right? I want this person to be awake when they're operating on me, so they're not going to hurt me. Uh, and the argument seems to be, but now why not make it a 25-hour shift or a 30-hour shift or a 35-hour shift and there's going to be some pressure from the viewpoint of funding and stuff like that. Well, there might be and so there ought to be regulations. I mean, it's not like you just add the enhancers and nothing else changes. You might need to add regulations to stop those abuses, okay? But what you don't want to do is to go back to eight-hour shifts for doctors, because it's important that they see the progress of the disease. It's important that they not switch personnel in the middle of an operation or in the middle of treating a patient, because a lot of accidents in the hospitals occur with the transfer of information problem, you know, from the new person to the old person, uh, from, from the old person to the new person. So there are reasons for these long shifts in some of these cases. Uh, and if we can keep the long shifts that for, that really do have a reason behind them, and, but make them safe with these enhancers, then again, like, okay, the new normal is now 20-hour shift without patients dying versus the old normal, which is 20-hour shifts with patients dying. I kind of like the new normal. Uh, and if they are pressured into that, they're pressured into that to save people's lives. Look, that's part of the job. You don't want to be a doctor. You don't have to do that. Uh, and if you want to go to a place where they've got 10-hour shifts, then okay, but you got to make sure there's not a downside because you don't see the progress of the disease. You don't lose patients from lack of information when you change from the old person to the new person. It's not so clear to me in some of these cases that the new normal uh, is all that bad. But there are cases where it is bad if in the academic setting students start getting lots and lots more homework so they don't have time with their friends and the students who are not as good have to spend six hours on the extra assignment where others spend an hour on the extra assignment. You can imagine problems like that, so there might have to be regulations. Uh, factory workers, forget the eight-hour shift, let's go to a 20-hour shift, you know, and all the workers have to be on modafinil and they don't get to spend time with their families and so on. Well, of course, that would be horrendous. That kind of new normal would be horrible, but I see no reason to think that would happen. Uh, and the reason is that when the enhancers come in and become the new normal, that's not going to be the only change. There have to be regulations that make sure they're not abused as well. And so when you think about this problem, don't just think, well, what if we have the enhancers or don't have the enhancers? You got to think about how people are going to react as that new normal develops so as to stop the problems. And if there are ways to do that, then I say we ought to have the enhancers uh, as well as regulations to prevent the abuses. Uh, this, this demonstrates the depth of our attachment to enhancements, that one would drink Waffle House coffee as opposed to nothing. I, oh, oh, God. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a true addict. And, and, it is better than, and it is better than nothing. So, um, so I'll start. Where uh, I'll start with Duke, since uh, Walter's sitting next to me, and uh, since Nicole had mentioned it earlier, and they're they're programmed to essentially allow therapeutic 
uh, we'll call it therapeutic intervention, uh, students who use, in this case, mostly Ritalin and Adderall, uh, to get themselves uh, from sort of below baseline to baseline, uh, and the disallow, disallowing uh, enhancement, which would be getting people who are already at baseline or above baseline, uh, even further above baseline. I mean, that's the policy, right? And the reasons, uh, some of the reasons that Nicole gave are, are ultimately like social reasons or social effect reasons, uh, cheating, uh, unfairness, I'm gonna uh, peer pressure, inequality, social injustice, so all these are the sorts of reasons uh, that we're given for thinking uh, that while we're okay with therapy, uh, we're not okay with enhancement, right? So, uh, and I'm gonna come back to that in a second. Uh, first, I just wanna say, one way of putting pressure on this approach is just to point out the ways in which we already tolerate enhancement for people who are already at baseline or above baseline. So if I have the funding, I, I tutor LSAT uh, and students take those classes and the students who take the LSAT classes clearly do better on the LSAT as a general rule than students who don't take the LSAT classes. And so I can take a student who's already very gifted and as long as they have the money, I can help them do better. I can improve their performance on an exam. And we don't have problems with those sorts of enhancements. And so one, one's just oddity with the enhancement debate is it looks like what people want to say is uh, some enhancements are okay, other enhancements aren't, aren't okay, and there's not a principled reason as far as I can tell for drawing that distinction, right? So what's the difference in a medication or a medical impl implementation or some of the things we already use as forms of implementation for our, for instance, already gifted children? And so already I don't know uh, why uh, we, we have for the people who have them, I already mentioned earlier, I, I'm happy, I'm, maybe I'm more transhumanistic than some people and I'm, I'm more pro-enhancement than, than probably most. Um, so I, I don't get the intuition. And so part of it is I just want a principal distinction even for that. So if you want to say, look, it's the right approach, enhancement's okay, it's just the wrong method. Like these, these sorts of enhancements aren't appropriate. Then I just want an account of why those enhancements aren't, aren't appropriate and others are. But that's not what I want to look at for, for the next couple seconds. I want to focus on the actual therapy versus enhancement distinction itself. Uh, this is something I was going to talk about uh, in the talk that Jen Bright and I are giving afterwards. Uh, but we actually ran some studies uh, at the last minute specifically for the conference, and so the stuff I was going to talk about, including the stuff in the abstract, sorry, uh, is not going to be talked about. <laughs> so I'll say a little bit about it now, only as a way of connecting to the stuff that's already been discussed uh, today. So here are uh, two sort of extended quotes from the President's Council of Bioethics uh, 2003 report uh, called Beyond Therapy. And it's been a very formative document. I read it, I have my students read it in every neuroethics class I've taught. And it's going to highlight this, this tension that I want to discuss. And I don't have a solution. It's more just to uh, invite people to think a little bit more carefully about how they want to draw this distinction and if, in fact, they want to draw it. So here's the first piece. As they say, most human capacities fall along a continuum or a normal distribution curve, and individuals who find themselves on the lower end of distribution may be considered disadvantaged and therefore unhealthy in, com in comparison with others. But the average may equally regard themselves as disadvantaged with regard to the above average. If one is responding in both cases to perceived disadvantage, on what principle can we call helping someone at the lower end therapy and helping someone who is merely average enhancement? In which cases of traits distributed normally, for example, height, or IQ or cheerfulness, does the average also function as a norm? Or is the norm itself appropriately subject to alteration? So that's the first part. So they, they introduce the distinction, which we always rely on in this debate between therapy and enhancement, only to problematize it and say that it's not as clear. It'd be nice if the distinction were a bit uh, more clear than it is. The next piece I want uh, is, a, is also a quote from the same document. Uh, this one's a little bit longer, and then I'll say, what I, say my part, and then uh, I'll pass it to the next person. Joining aspirations to overcome common human limitations are comparable to aspirations to overcome individual short, uh, shortfalls in native endowment. For there is wide variation in natural gifts with which each of us is endowed. Some are born with perfect pitch, others are born tone deaf, some have flypaper memories, others forget immediately what they have just learned, and as with talent, so too with desires and temperaments. Some crave immortal fame, others merely comfortable preservation, some are sanguine, others phlegmatic, still others bilious or melancholic. When nature dispenses her gifts, some receive only at the end of the line. As a result of these infirmities, particular and universal, human beings have long dreamed of overcoming limitations of body and soul. Right? So, to t go back to Neil, we'll use Neil Levy, because I admit, I don't know how the guy finds the time. Let's just assume he's not enhancing. I'd be surprised. I know Neil. But let's just assume he's not. So here we have naturally gifted Neil Levy, naturally gifted and hardworking Neil Levy. And let's just assume that he's far above the baseline, and he's actually far above wherever I am at. Like, I'll just assume for the sake of arm, I'm just at baseline, right? Why, why think that if I were below the baseline, it'd be acceptable for me, that, that counter, my counterpart who's below baseline, to therapeutically get up to where I currently am? No problem with that. 
But if I, for no fault of my own, happen to be born exactly where I am, I'm not entitled to go further to where Neil Levy is just by luck. Right? So there's a, there's a lottery of life issue here that it looks like what we want to say, and I have, we'll look at data actually that supports this claim, that it looks like we think, or lots of people think, you're entitled to be average. Right? So if you're born below average, then we don't mind you like therapeutically getting yourself up to where most people are. But you're not allowed to enhance yourself to above average. Now if you're born above average, good for you. But otherwise, you're just stuck where you're at, right? So this, this is a weird, uh, the intuition is a very strange intuition. What, what it looks like people think is that you can be naturally disadvantaged, and then we're, you're allowed to remedy that, but only up to the point where you're average. But if you're born uh, lucky, let's say, um, with any capacity, so whatever distribution curve, pick any capacity you want, if you're born lucky, we don't think it's an unfair advantage. We think it's an unfair disadvantage if you're below baseline. We don't think it's an unfair advantage if you're above baseline. No one's suggesting we should uh, dumb people down to baseline. Take the geniuses and like make them, right? So, I mean, I guess one thing is, it looks like, let's go back to Walter's claim about all boats, will, uh, all boats shall rise. Well, they, they, they will, you, you, we can talk about all boats uh, may rise. And then when we talk about that, what we're, really, what we're really talking about is shifting the baseline. Right, so this is just to say all baselines will shift. Right? Because there's going to be no enhancement drug, at least as far as I can tell, that's going to have a differential effect such that if you take it at the, at the very high end, it will do nothing for you. I mean, maybe there will be some drugs like that. And if you're at the low end, it'll catch you up so that you can go from an 80 IQ to a 160 IQ. But if you take it at 160, you get nothing out of it. Right? So all you're going to do is just get a shifting, a shifting baseline. So I don't know what, I mean, what, what the problem is in that if what we're talking about are capacities. Now, of course, you just have the same capacity. You still have a continuum. You still have... Uh, the same thing you had before, it's just that the whole baseline has shifted. Everyone has more of the capacity, and if it's a capacity we think is good, all the, all the better. All the better, I think. Well, anyway, there's my, there's my spiel. But if, if you want to know what, what, what non-philosophers think and non-crazy philosophers think, uh, then you can come to Gemini's talk, because we're going to talk about what well, non-philosophers think. Maybe that's no better. Maybe it's worse. I don't know. We'll see. But thank you. Well, I guess it's going to be more uh, transhumanistic stuff from me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm largely going to echo what uh, Walter and to some extent Thomas have said with maybe uh, a few disagreements. I don't think there are major disagreements. Uh, one thing I, I want to pick up in what Walter said was had to do with competition. Uh, I think it's important, maybe that's what uh, Walter was getting at, uh, it's important to point out that it's a false assumption to view these, these neural interventions that we're discussing as uh, grounding purely positional goods. I mean, they, they don't have potential merely as uh, you know, promoting individual people's interests and giving them a positional advantage. They have general so societal benefits uh, that, that they promise, which is why, largely why we're having this conversation right now. So, so it would be a mistake to see them purely as uh, competitive tools. Uh, and if that's what Walter was uh, meaning, then I, I agree with that. I'm, I'm not sure that the competition element should be uh, disregarded. Uh, I don't think it should be set aside, because like, the job market, there's no uh, avoiding the fact that it is largely competitive. So, uh, and there's no denying that if there's a new normal that gets in place, because these interventions become widespread and, you know, uh, the typical academic becomes as efficient as Neil Levy, and I, I don't want to embrace readily in a modafinil or the more effective version of, of these interventions, then surely my, I'm out of luck, right? I can say goodbye to any academic career. The, the fact that I might produce the odd, like, even good paper is not going to impress any selection committee. So I'm going to be harmed. You know, let's not uh, you know, pretend that it is not there's not an important competitive element, whether in academic or on a non-academic contexts. Uh, but uh, uh, still, I, I mostly agree with uh, Walter's position on this. Uh, I'd still like to come back to what Nicole, uh, the way Nicole phrased the, the problem and, and try and get at the, the kind of core intuitions that might be uh, driving these concerns. So you, you mentioned freedom. I think that's really a core issue here. Freedom is an important value. Uh, but again, to come back to what uh, something Nita Fahrenheit uh, mentioned yesterday when he, she was talking about rights and how certain rights are important but not absolute, like they can be overridden sometimes. 
here I'm not so sure that I want to talk about rights, given that we're not necessarily uh, talking about intrusions into the private thoughts of people. Uh, the, the, the sort of interventions we're discussing have more to do with pressuring people to change themselves in some way, rather than kind of stealing their, their private thoughts. But regardless, freedom is, is a very important value. It's something we rightly care about. But it's still just one value among others, right? It, it's something that we have to weigh against competing considerations when such comp uh, considerations arise. So I fully agree. Uh, if society were, were to bust me around, to bust us around, put pressure on us to embrace these new technologies for like arbitrary or frivolous reasons, you know, all the cool, all the cool kids are taking modafinil these days, and we care a lot about coolness, so you know, we're going to put pressure on you to enhance yourself. We, we would have very good reasons to object to that, uh, even if the, the only consideration at stake is, is freedom and, and uh, our interest in not being bossed or, around. But obviously, this is not the sort of scenarios that Nicole was describing. The, the, the sort of scenarios that she was describing were interventions where there would be pressure on certain workers to take these uh, interventions, use these interventions, because of significant benefits. And we're talking about saving people's lives in the extreme, reducing the number of medical errors, if we're talking of uh, uh, air traffic controllers, reducing the number of accidents, uh, we can think of many other, many other examples. So, uh, reducing number of deaths, reducing number of injuries, improving people's quality of life, these are very, very powerful considerations. So we have to weigh these expected positive outcomes, assuming that really it's reasonable to expect them, which is uh, one of the assumptions we're making. Uh, we have to weigh them against our interest in being able to choose whether or not we want to use these interventions. Which of these considerations are going to be the weightiest? Well, I think here perhaps it might help if we consider uh, a concept that's mentioned uh, quite nicely on the, on the, in the description for this panel. Uh, it uh, mentions neo-Luddites. Uh, so these people who are very uh, refractory to technology. I, I'm not using this term as a term of abuse, by the way, just as a descriptive term, but it's people who stay away, generally speaking, from modern technology. Uh, it describes a very a diverse group of people. The Amish would be an example, uh, but there are other, other examples that are less tied to religious convictions. Uh, well, the infamous Unabomber was a, is a famous neo-Luddite. Uh, people who object to the things that we, I guess, take, all take for granted, computers, mobile phones, they think for various reasons that these things are bad and that society would be better off without them. What's our attitude uh, as a society to uh, these people? Uh, there's no denying that these people are going to ex uh, experience costs. They are experiencing costs if they live by their own standards, if they say, I refuse to use computers in any way for my line of work, I refuse to use mobile phones, I refuse to use the internet. They're going to close themselves off from various job opportunities. There's no denying that. Uh, do we think, should, should we think it's a, a problem? And, and do we think it's a problem? Uh, my impression is that we don't think that that's a problem. We don't take special measures to protect neo-Luddites, guarantee their uh, equality of opportunity when they're you know, competing for jobs. Uh, and presumably the reason why is that we think that they don't have compelling reasons for their objections to new technology. Uh, it might be sort of an aesthetic reason that they might have. It might be reasons having to do with freedom. It might be an interest in protecting certain traditions. I'm not saying that these things have no weight, once again. But the question is, are they weighty enough? My impression is that we think uh, they're not in this case. Uh, and it seems to me that these cases are structurally similar to the scenarios that Nicole was describing in which we're assuming we have these enhancement technologies that are reasonably safe and effective. So for the sake of consistency, it seems to me if we don't think there's a problem uh, because computers have become the new normal, for instance, then we shouldn't think that it would be in itself a problem either if cognitive enhancement becomes the new normal. So, if you would like.
So uh, I actually consider myself a liberal in these cases, but uh, just for the sake of argument, let me try to get some disagreement here into this discussion, especially with respect to the first two commentators. But uh, give me some minutes or just some seconds to develop my argument a little bit um, more comprehensively. So um, the first thing, I'm a lawyer and I will argue from a little bit of legal perspective, but not from a positive law perspective. I think um, obviously when we talk about should we regulate enhancement, we should have in mind that at least Ritalin and these substances are controlled substances, sometimes even under international law. And so we are talking a little bit about a reform of current drug laws in a sense. And one of the interesting things is uh, to observe that we have these technologies, especially the electronic stimulation devices, which are not regulated at all. And then we have these international drug control regime laws, which are quite severe. And I think so there's an inconsistency here and we should try to develop a system by which we can, which encompasses all kinds of neuro tools and we must have the same normative standards for them, I think. So that is just a remark. But now let me try to take up where Nita Farahani left us yesterday. I also believe that there is a right to cognitive liberty or mental self-determination. And I think that right implies the use of neuro tools, whatever they are, because the content of the right is that each and every one can self-determine what is in and on her mind, to, to put it that way. Um, but that right is not accepted today. That is more demand, and one can argue, as she did and as many others do, that this is something like an implicit premise of liberal democracies. But be this as it may, um, we, we do have such a right, I would assume, and these rights can be limited. And there was the exchange yesterday between Paul Wolpe and Nita whether that right is absolute. And if one construes these rights so broadly that they even comprise the use of neuro tools, they cannot be absolute. Of course, states can limit access to, to substances which are severely harmful to others. That's a paternalism debate, but I'm not going to get into this. I think there's an, with respect to how medical devices and drug laws uh, today's drug laws are thought about and interpreted, I think there's an interesting point. Because, of course, at one stage you have a risk-benefit assessment. And today, the risk-benefit assessment mostly comprises risks as risks, but the benefits that are taken into account are only those of therapeutic value. So basically, these people weigh the risks and the usefulness in medical therapy against the risks. But of course, many people take substances or want to use TDCS devices for other purposes. And those benefits, which at least those persons perceive as benefits, are not taken into account in these assessments. And I think that is a mistake. And I think that's what the cognitive enhancement debate shows, that there are reasonable things people might want to do to themselves with these tools. And that should at least be recognized by, by lawmakers and regulators. OK. so. Um, I think the more broader issue, which has not really been discussed, and the, the whole enhancement debate strikes me a little bit as acontextual sometimes, that of course um, these, many of these devices and substances are not only um, positively improving cognition, but they have side effects. And now we can always say, okay, let's talk about that perfect enhancer which is risk-free or has a risk profile of coffee. Okay, we can do this, but this is not the kind of things we are talking about. And even from the empirical side, it's completely unclear what those more fine or subtle effects on, on our mental states are. I myself have been involved in empirical research, and it's quite hard even to design measurements, how we want to find out which cross effects, let's say, Ritalin has. It's really hard to, to set up test batteries which do these kind of things. And you, then you do it with one trial and only with a certain population. So we just do not really know. And I would just assume, and I know that that's a controversial assumption, that there, are, there can be many subtle effects, especially on emotional things, which are not quite clear to us. So in the sense, at the moment, this is just an experiment. And, and, and the empirical research is not um, developed far enough to make any reasonable risk-benefit assessment at this stage, I would say. And 
even if we would have the empirical knowledge, there's an interesting thing from the ethical side. I think we need a framework to discuss which kind of mental states are desirable to have. I mean, we always talk about pain is bad and pleasure is nice and cognitive enhancement is good. But I mean, we need much more fine-grained criteria about, let's say, emotional dullness, all these kinds of things. Is it good for us to have them? Is it bad for us to have them? I, as a lawyer, cannot do these kind of things, but that is something like a request for all the ethicists. The, we, we need an ethics of which kinds of mental states are good having, and I think that's much more complicated than this rather oversimplified talk that we hear a lot. Okay, now let me come to the controversial point. As I said, there is a right to take these um, substances and to use neurotope tools, but the very same right also implies the right to not take these things. You know, self-determination is not only a right to, but also a right against, in a sense. So I think that whoever argues that there is a right to take these tools must, on pain of self-contradiction, accept that there is a right of everyone else to not take these things and to remain free from these kind of interventions. And there are good arguments why people do not want to take these things, and they're not all bioconservatives or based on crude metaphysics and all these or only intuitive, but in the end, false ideas. I think how we want to be in the, men in the mental way is something that is a highly personal thing. And from the legal perspective, I can only say there's a right not to be exposed to these kind of things. So now we are having a, a typical balancing problem. We have, rec we have different interests. Some people may want to take it, others may want to reject it. So strictly speaking, my freedom to not take these things is not compromised if you all take them. In a very formal, strict sense, there's no coercion, I agree. However, we have to take a look at the competitive context, and I'm not interested in the competitive context of tenured professors, but in all those academics who might not have made it through that bottleneck yet, and to actually one everyone else who is uh, in the workforce, so to speak. I mean, we just have to see what is the social situation now. We have this, what you, in English you call it the uh, knowledge society. So basically what, what you want from people in all kinds of jobs today is cognitive capacities. You have these huge amounts of information that have to be processed that basically exceed our abilities and it's not going to stop. It's going to be more and more and more. So what we want is highly uh, cognitive fit people. And on the other side, at least that's a European point and I, I think perhaps correct me if I'm wrong, I assume that this is the same in the US. You have a lot of people, in the, in the usual workers, which are just exhausted. You know, they, we have this burnout syndrome, that, you know, a form of depression, that people just cannot cope with this informational overload anymore. And in this situation, that's a social situation, and now we have these devices that improve cognitive capacities. And now we cannot say, well, where's the competition? Of course, it's highly competitive. People will be more or less softly forced into doing these kind of things. And so that is a classical thing where, where lawmakers and regulators have to step in and where we have to make value judgments, value judgments about what kinds of pressures do we want to have in a society. And, there's, and, and I think there's a fairly good case to make that we do not, I don't want to live in a society where taking Ritalin is something that is expected of me. And because of that, I think uh, regulation and a curbing of your freedom to take these things might be warranted, but that's an open democratic decision. And I think there's a good case to be made for that. Thanks. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank Nicole for inviting me to be part of this panel. And uh, I'm I think I'm catching a bit of a cold, so I'm trying to compete with the other panelists in being coherent. And uh, So there are many issues that Nicole identified, and there are many more on which I could uh, talk and on which I have published, actually. But I will limit myself in the interest of time on just three that will try to sort of make sense of what the issues are. First of all, I must, must say that uh, apart from being a neuroethicist, I'm also a political theorist, so I'm taking liberal democracy very seriously. Now, when we're talking about the decision to take cognitive enhancement, we have to dissociate at which level the decision is made. 
And here, I'll just use shortcuts. Me, we, all of us. So the first level is the individual level. A person decides whether to use coffee or whatever stimulant. But at the same level is the decision of the medical uh, practitioner whether to prescribe or not to prescribe a medication. So keep that in mind. Second level is the we. It's the non-public reason. A group, uh, neo-Luddites and uh, uh, transhumanists have been mentioned, but also organizations, universities, such as uh, Duke, or we could imagine a transhumanist university that would have an internal policy that every student should take enhancements. Now, the point being is that the level of sort of intrusion into others is very different. Uh, if we compare that to all of us, all of us is all members of society. That is the level of laws and international law in this case. Now, there, it has been some mention there's no reason to think there will be some changes. Well, there are historical reasons to think there could be some changes. Take the example of Togo militarists in the Second World War. They were extremely sort of uh, uh, enthusiastic about the use of amphetamines. And by the way, Adderall is an amphetamine. So they made it a law that everyone that works for the military has to use amphetamines. Now, that led to the millions of people being addicted to amphetamine and the so-called uh, uh, amphetamine addiction crisis in the 50s in, the, in Japan. Also, you have to take into account that these substances are regulated for a good reason, because speed is also amphetamine. Now, we can go into the issue of specific substances, and I'll go only to a small extent into that. But let's turn back to the issue of the level of decision making. Now, even though we may sort of encourage Duke students to sort of go into a larger debate or argue with, let's say, Jehovah's Witnesses or whoever about their internal policy, all in all, you can vote by your legs. You can just move away from them. You have that choice in a liberal society. And this is what a liberal democracy needs to sort of respect the right of a minority to organize, to have its own non-public policy. Also, we need to respect the right of an individual to sort of uh, uh, endorse his or her uh, comprehensive view, whether it's metaphysical, whether it's religious, whether it's sort of, uh, I don't know how to characterize transhumanism, so sorry. Uh, at any rate. Progressive. Sorry? Progressive. Progr whatever. <laughs> Ideological, let's, let's keep it at that. So at any rate, the liberal state needs to, and there has been talk about regulation, and that is indeed, it's time for, think, for thinking about policy and regulation. And in the presentation of my paper, which I invite you to come to, I will be talking a bit more about regulation, and specifically regulation of transcranial direct current stimulation. Now come, to come back to the topic, we need to dissociate what, is, what level of evidence is necessary to interfere in any of these levels of decision making? The second point I want to make is that in a liberal democracy, we really need to take into account what the public thinks. Now, because the laws are actually sh are supposed to represent the will of the majority. And uh, I'm also a hint. Uh, look out for the uh, edited volume by myself and Fabrizio Taran under contract with Oxford University Press, uh, Cognizement Ethical and Policy Issues in International Perspectives. Now, we have some data from all over the world. I'm just going to mention a couple of them. I've done some of this research uh, myself uh, with the collaborators in Germany. But we have from virtually every country that we have data from, including the UK, including uh, Taiwan, including Germany, that there is an overwhelming majority thinking that there is something wrong with taking cognitive enhancement drugs if they're medication. Also, we have the overwhelming majority thinking that everything is fine if you're taking coffee. So we need to take into account the differences. Of course, we also need to take into account that there is a steady minority that thinks that taking uh, uh, medication is perfectly fine and we need to take into account that there is a steady minority that thinks that even taking coffee is not fine. Now, 
The point being is that liberal democracy needs to have such laws and regulations that respects these levels of decision making, respects the individuals, respects the group, and has the sufficient level of evidence to justify the laws which are coercive. Now, when I'm saying coercive, take a look uh, or take the example of, of the medication that is standing there. Uh, Professor Armstrong uh, prudently uh, refused to say what is that because there is a difference. If it's modafinil, that's perfectly fine because it's only scheduled as class four drug. So it's not as, but if it were a dead roll and there were evidence that he is all having perhaps without prescription, an amphetamine-based substance, the whole brunt of the law could be upon him. Will this happen or not? I don't know. <laughs> we could also talk about whether it should be the case that the whole brunt of the law would be upon him in the case of Ritalin as well, which is not amphetamine, but methylphenidate. But there are the facts. As Chris mentioned, the UN Convention on Psychotropic Drugs from 71, and Americans might say, well, why do we care? We're in America. Let's say UN Convention. Well, in 78, the US uh, passed a law that is binding, uh, which has the exact same requirements as the convention. We have to take into account, this brings me to the uh, third point, the relevant effects side effects and so on and so forth of cognitive enhancers. For coffee, we know them more or less. Even the public has a lot of experience with that. For amphetamine, we actually know them as well. And even though people who are taking students perhaps, they, they don't know, they're uh, lulled by the sort of promise that this is a study aid or ADHD medication, they might not know that this is amphetamine. And if you're on amphetamine or high doses of amphetamine for three or more weeks, you might get an amphetamine psychosis, which could make you basically sort of lose your capacity for a limited amount of time. Now, this needs to be taken into account. The legal status, current legal status, that is changeable, of course. The risk of abuse and very nasty side effects. The amount of knowledge we possess we know very little about modafinil. It is a fairly recent drug. So it does work in the short run. But what about the long run? So we, when making policy, and I've made some uh, sort of uh, suggestions in this direction, I will not go into this now, we have to take into account that who is reaping the benefits and who is taking the side effects. Now, even though we might not expect Togo militarists to, to have policy in the United States. We also might expect that there could be a shift in working hours for people who are, let's say, Mexican, illegal immigrants, or working for Amazon, packing books. Now, the point being, they're, in, they're not in the condition to object. And if there is a steady supply on the work market, then the organization might say, well, you know, we should promote taking of these cognitive enhancement drugs. In the short term, we'll gain profit because our workers will be more productive. But in the long run, if they have health issues, that's just their cost, not our cost. So the state needs to be very careful and we need to have the evidence to make a policy besides just, okay, this is, where is the difference between coffee or this or that. Of course, we need to be wary of our biases and the status quo bias. If something is regulated by law, that might not mean that it is fair. But we need to engage in a public discussion in which different points of view are seriously considered. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, I can't express my gratitude for the deeply thoughtful comments. Um, in response to this, Jane. All made possible by. All made sorry. possible by uh, Vyvanse and Ritalin and so on and so forth. Um, what I'm going to ask is, Jay, could you come and help by grabbing the microphone and bringing it to people who ask the questions? Because I really would like to make sure that the questions are recorded for later on. Um, 
Someone might mention drugs and then to prosecute him, right? Ah, yes, yeah, yes, exactly. yes. That's the whole point. <laughs> yes, I'm actually, I'm actually here to arrest you all. You all. Um, there you go. Okay, I believe that there was a question here first somewhere. Were you first, I think? Actually, one of you may have been first. Let's say you were first. Uh huh. Um, so, my question is for the people, or maybe one or two of you who uh, don't necessarily agree with uh, the use of cognitive enhancements. But I, I don't think you would disagree in the use of it for treatment. But I think in a legal, at least with the current legal setting, there are people who are technically legally getting it as treatment. But if we bring up the issue of a bell curve in terms of these traits, I mean, I can definitely say on, on my college campus, people know how to get a prescription for Adderall when they know I don't have ADD. So how can we, I guess, reconcile wanting it as a treatment, but where, where are we going to draw that line of treatment and cognitive enhancement if we are going to set these legal boundaries, but people can still break them? Um, do you want to respond first? Or, or I can. Or should I? You can start and then I'll All right, cool. So basically, that, that is a uh, very important issue that you're raising, because uh, apart from malingering and so on and so forth, the issue is with the scarce resources of the society, because uh, society might be very justified in saying, OK, we cannot provide everyone, and perhaps we should not, because they would object it. We should not pump it in the water supply. But there is a limited amount of funds that is available for healthcare. So we should make sure that only those who really need the medication, and uh, it could be argued that it allows them to compete on an equal footing with the rest. So the baseline argument is not without entirely without any merits. That is something the society has the duty to provide, whereas providing uh, to someone who is already, well, better off to be able to be more better off to sort of increase, that's the motivation. I'm not saying that would happen because the, the, the reverse might happen if they're taking amphetamines. Uh, that is something the society must sort of uh, take into consideration as something that should not be made available from public funds. Now, there are uh, ways, and uh, mind you, even better off in, in the larger societal mm -hmm. context have been mentioned, but that is also part of social philosophy. Take progressive taxation, for example. Yes, some people are richer. Some people, by sheer luck, are better off. But they, they might earn more. But they pay more taxes. And this tax money is uh, the pool from which medications, depending on the country, of course, medications and benefits for the least well-off are taken from. Does that answer your question? My question was more the fact that people that people are using it currently as cognitive enhancement under the guise of treatment. Like, you know, it's, they, they don't actually have ADD, but yet they're given a prescription for treatment of ADD. So if, if, it's, if it's already happening as cognitive enhancement, might it make more sense than if we're talking about fairness to even the playing field, if people are already yep. getting access to it as such? They're just on, you know, in support of that, let me point out that under the current situation, it's people who are willing to break the law and cheat who are doing better because they've got these additional aids. Whereas the people who are law abiding and refuse to do it because it's against the law, they don't get the, the step ahead. Uh, and if you legalized it, you would stop that inequality and, and you know, quit like promoting and enhancing only the people who are willing to break the law. So really quick, you're focusing on Ritalin and Adderall, which is more appropriate, I think, for colleges and universities, at least at the student level. But if we're talking about faculty, a 2008 survey of Nature of the Readers of Nature showed that one in five of the scientists, 60 scientists, represented 60 countries around the world, said that they were using provigil. Um, the off-label uh, pres prescriptions, off-label prescriptions for modafinil went up between 2002 and 2009, 15-fold. Uh, so I mean, I mean, so even in, I mean, in your case, like that's certainly happening not just among students who are doing it illegally, so to speak, if you want to call it that, but it's happening among well, at least some of the people in here. I don't know who they are. <laughs> so if I may just uh, say something quickly, of course we have the problem of practically enforcing these regulations. I see that, but one should not turn that 
practical problem into a normative argument, which some people to the left of me trying to do. Of course, um, we can say regulation is ineffective, so let's not do it. Okay, but that's such a weak argument. Rather than doing it like this, why don't we openly talk to those people? Why don't we get a debate at universities where we really try to appeal a little bit perhaps in a sense as Penn University does to, to the honor of students to say, come on, it's, I know it gives you a competitive advantage in the short time, but in the long time, if you all do it, you know, now you are on the, on the receiving side and the other, it will be vice versa also. I mean, we can at least try to do this rather than just saying, well, regulation doesn't, doesn't work at all. So I never found that a quite um, um, appealing argument to say practically it won't work. You can say the same with drug regulation. Obviously, drug regulations don't work because all people use drugs, but that doesn't make drug regulation as such. They might be wrong for different reasons, but not for that reason. If, if I can quickly add a final thought on that. I think your question really highlights the importance of solid data on the effects of these uh, substances. And, and perhaps I can take this opportunity to also stress that we, we should avoid like misunderstanding uh, the, our respective views and, and seeing disagreements where there are no disagreements. So uh, Velko and, and Christoph clearly highlighted the fact that the substances we have at the moment are known to have side effects, so sometimes we don't know exactly what their safety profile is, so we should proceed with caution. Uh, I completely agree with that. I, I, I don't disagree uh, with these claims. Uh, it's just that were in my response to Nicole's thought experiment, perhaps I and, and Thomas and, and Walter were more willing to go along with the initial assumptions, which were, imagine you have, you know, we've solved the safety problems, whereas uh, Velko and Christoph were more keen to insist on, on the kind of interventions we have at the moment. So, so to have, uh, I think to, to, to respond properly to your question and to know what would be the right course of action to take, we really we need to know more about uh, the effects of the substances, their uh, long-term efficiency and safety, because uh, that could make the difference between, say, leveling up or leveling down, even if you want a, a level playing field. Um, I, there are 12 comments I could make, but I'll limit myself. First, I just want to clarify what I said to Nita yesterday was agnostic, what I said to her was agnostic on the question of my right to control my own brain through drugs, it was simply a comment about the state's right to intervene, about which I'm an extremist, that I think cognitive liberty demands that the skull is a complete zone of privacy against state intervention. My right to control my own brain is a separate question. But, but two comments on what was said here. The first is, we can't gloss over the historical and deeply embedded difference between the way we think about pharmaceuticals and the way we think about other kinds of enhancements. And it's written into law, it's written into the hum human consciousness, right? When the new iPhone 6 comes out, came out, when they tested it, presumably amongst their employees and their testers, they didn't have to get informed consent, they didn't have phase one, phase two, and phase three trials. Okay, we think about things that change our body chemistry differently than we think about iPhones and computers. Now, you might want to argue that that's mistaken, but you can't gloss over that difference and say, well, we have people at work use computers, we might as well have people at work take cognitive enhancers. That's a category error that at least has to be addressed before it's assumed that they're the same thing because they're not. And the second point, and then I'm done, is in the therapy enhancement difference, we have to ask ourselves, why is that difference important? It's important only for two reasons. One is a theoretical one, which all of us, all of you discuss. That is, is that a meaningful difference and should we put any theoretical or philosophical weight in it? And there I agree with what almost all of you said. But there is a second reason why we make that distinction, and that's a little thornier. And that has to do with what a just society should pay for, right? So we agree that if someone can't afford drugs and we think of them as sick and the drugs as therapy, we as a society should try to provide them. And if we're not gonna also provide free of charge and as part of our insurance, every enhancement that a person at baseline wants to make to reach Neil Levy, then if we're not gonna pay for all of that, then we have to at some point make a definitional difference between those things we think of as therapeutic treatment, as treatments, and those things we think of as enhancement, as difficult as that is philosophically, or else we have to pay for everything. So we can't gloss over that difference either if we're going to have an insurance-based or a reimbursement-based system where we pay for some kinds of things and don't pay for others. 
I'm not sure who you think was glossing over that distinction, uh, because I certainly wasn't. Uh, I mean, I gave examples of non-mechanical substances we take in our bodies as enhancers that are, you know, totally allowed. And, you know, there might be an important distinction there, there might not, but in no way did my argument depend on glossing over that distinction. I just wanted to make that clear. I want also add to the issue, I'm not saying that anyone is glossing over it, but uh, to sort of uh, uh, share my opinion on the issue. Uh, it, as much as the treatment enhancement distinction is tricky, we have to realize that it's a social construct defined by law. I mean, take the example of maturity. Maturity is basically a right. Uh, the society tells you that at a certain age, be it 16 for driving, 18 for voting or whatever, 21 for drinking, and in, in the uh, old uh, British Empire, 25 for uh, taking your affairs into your own hands, then you have that right. Even though there's no amount of neurological data that would say that a person with, say, 17 months, uh, 17, sorry, years and 11 months, and 11, uh, sorry, 18 years and one month is categorically different. I mean, there, these are fuzzy boundaries, but we need to make the distinction because the law is binary. The language of rights is binary. Do you have a right or you don't have a right? So, in effect, it's a social construct. In, in some sense, it is arbitrary, but not in all senses of the word. word. It is arbitrary where exactly the, the line is drawn, but it is not arbitrary that the line must be drawn. I hope this helps. I drew an analogy between computers and, and cognitive enhancers. I don't know if I was the only one to do that, but perhaps I can quickly respond to that. Uh, so I, I agree we shouldn't gloss over the, the difference you've pointed out. Uh, I do think, however, that we should be willing to uh, critically examine the presuppositions behind uh, difference of treatment in those cases. Uh, it seems to me that to a, at least an extent, our intuitions about the importance of protecting people from you know, having to modify their bodily chemistry, as you put it, might be uh, driven, uh, there might be, uh, not be pure intuitions about the right to dispose of your own body. There might be partly intuitions about safety. You know, tinkering with your body with new interventions typically uh, is dangerous business, especially at the beginning. So that might be partly what drives uh, the force of this distinction. Once we get safety aside, I'm no longer sure how strong this kind of, uh, what, what the normative force of this distinction is. Uh, also, to come back to something that, that Christoph talked about in his talk yesterday, uh, you, you could have uh, people like trying to get around the, the sort of barrier that, that's being erected there by pointing out that uh, computers interfere with our brain chemistry. Uh, computer literacy clearly changes our brains in ways that we, we would not change it if we were only using pen and paper throughout our lives. So it's, I, I think this boundary is fuzzier than we might initially think. Okay, so I want to add, I want to add a comment to, uh, on this point, because I can. Um, so we already accept other ways of enhancing, right? So, I mean, you, you pointed, like, look, I mean, there's already tutoring available, for instance, and so you tutor certain, certain kids. Um, the mere fact that we already do certain things isn't yet, I think, a good reason for us to say, right, we therefore should uh, keep saying, well, look, there's no difference between this and this, really speaking, so let's just do this. And in fact, look, we've, we've already endorsed all these other ways of uh, living our lives differently. Um, all the, and the reason why this is important is because note that the way in which this, the whole new normal argument is usually responded to by people is by thinking that, I'm, that what me and Emma Jane are saying is that, no, we should stop this. That's not the point. The point is simply to say, what is it? Have we actually stopped for a second and thought about whether or not we would like to live in a society uh, which does those sorts of things? So let me use a, diff a different example. If I happen to be, uh, if I trained as a lawyer or as a medical, well, then you have to keep up to date, you know, so you keep going to these courses, quite often these courses are after hours, um, and you often have to, you know, get like mega red eye and sacrifice time with your family. Now, you might want to say, well, look, tough bickies, you know, uh, suck it up, Nicole. Indeed, maybe. 
Or maybe another response is to say, uh, you know, that's not the sort of thing which we want. Yes, we do want people to, for instance, uh, make sure that they're up to date on all the latest uh, techniques of life saving. I mean, yes, saving lives is kind of important. But all that my suggestion here is, is that perhaps we could regulate to do it better, such that if somebody needs to indeed attend courses, well then make sure you give them time to attend those courses, such that they can retain some time in their life to be humans, to simply lead, uh, you know, pleasant lives. And this also links up with the point that you made, Alex, you know, about you know, it's just an aesthetic. It's just an aesthetic thing that, you know, that I, don't, I don't want. Really? Just an aesthetic? What sort of society I'm going to live is, uh, live in is just an aesthetic? No, this is a really important issue. You know, I don't want to live in certain kinds of societies. Um, and whilst it's not the case that I'm now therefore saying, so let's allow people to die because of this aesthetic. You know, so here I am, I'm able to choose to uh, take these enhancers, but now look, my aesthetic is too important, I'm precious about that. That's not the point. The point is to say, Precisely what sorts of societies might be generated as a consequence of just accepting the currently extremely tempting options in front of me. Yeah, to take, you know, to take these drugs, to make sure that I can do better. And to then treat this as a reason right now to make, uh, to make my decisions. And in the end, I might say, I love that society. I too am a transhumanist. I sign up. You know, where's my form? Um, but not to just do this simply as a consequence of you know, having made this decision in the short term, uh, like, well, here's this very enticing thing, and then to find ourselves in this society without even having thought about whether or not we'd be sacrificing certain important things. So the new normal argument isn't meant to be fear-mongering, it's meant to be consciousness-raising about what sorts of things we would like in the future. So, c could you just explain to me what important things we're sacrificing if we take modafinil and have four hours less sleep, spend two hours more on our work, and two hours more with our friends? Um, okay. I want to have a go. I'm not sure if I can tell you. Um, actually, no, let, let, me, let me respond to it differently. So, Remember that one of, so one of the reasons that I'm looking at this right is to look at the relationship between responsibility and mental capacity. And one of the, way, and one of the things that's bugged me for years now, actually, uh, is the way in which capacitarianism should be understood. Um, and here's how I have understood it. Um, the way I understood it is that once somebody creates an opportunity, a really good, you know, a way for me to enhance my capacity, a really worthwhile capacity, what ought I to do? Ought I to take this, uh, to embrace this? Um, it seems like the right answer should be, well, yes, you ought to, Nicole, you ought to embrace this, because, you know, I mean, what are you sacrificing right now? All that I'm trying to do is to say, uh-uh, this is a way of pulling focus to, the very, to a very, very short-term way of reasoning. Uh, what we ought to actually do is to say, all right, this provides me right now with a reason to say, a prima facie reason to take into account as to what I ought to do. Um, so right now, in the short term, perhaps, indeed, I ought to enhance. But let me think about what, kinds of, uh, what kind of society this may generate. Now, Veliko, before, talked about uh, the possibility of certain minorities being exploited. Uh, you know, so immigrants in the country who may not be in a, politi in a politically feasible situation to say, no, actually, I'd, I'd rather not live that sort of lifestyle. Why? Because I find it aesthetically yuck. It's a, it's a, it's a society in which... Um, in which maybe I can no longer practice my religion. And I'm not religious, right? So the, the last thing that I'm trying to do here is to peddle religion uh, at you. But I do think that it matters that in a liberal democracy, what we do is we listen to people to find out what sort of society they would like. And not just to say, well, look, I have my own ideas here about what a better society would be. And I'm going to permit these things to be unregulated simply because I reckon that that would be a good idea. Um, I think this must be open to a much broader uh, public. You know, so even if, even if I personally don't, don't find anything mm. unappealing about this, even if I'm a workaholic, which I have been, uh, I don't think that's yet a reason for me to say indoors. If I may add something, uh, or add something, sorry, uh, to this debate, not to put anyone on the spot, but I feel I need to explain that the mechanisms of action of modafinil are not clear, and apart from orexin, uh, 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 which is a neuropeptide which it affects 
and this helps in the cases of narcolepsy, which is a serious disorder. So people could fall asleep and fall down and get run over by cars. So it, there, it makes sense to take even long-term side effects uh, into account, saying, okay, this will save your life. As for other effects, because we don't know exactly how it works, it is also a noradrenaline, a noradrenaline sorry, reuptake inhibitor, which increases the blood pressure and we have no data on the long-term consequences. But one, one more thing is uh, certain, there is sleep rebound. So even though you can uh, do it for a short amount of time to sort of party hard and uh, study hard and so on and so forth, you'll have to unless you're like that woman that sleeps one hour. We don't know how is it that she sleeps one no, hour. No, they but, couldn't figure that out. But <laughs> we might compare what her level of achievement is to others in society. Is she a brilliant uh, professor with tenure or, or not? Or, okay, we can say Bill Clinton, well, he achieved a lot. With, but, okay, for the sake of the argument, uh, we, might, we have to realize if we're mentioning uh, specific existing drugs, and why is this important? Because the producer of that drug would like you to think that you can do it uh, without any problem. In fact, the producer of this drug has earned so much money on this propaganda campaign that when they paid for damages for it, that was just a minor slice of the profit cake and that was good marketing. So we need to be careful. We need to be more critical and as much as I as a philosopher uh, like thought experiments, I, I'm also uh, coming from a critical theory tradition. I'm wary of corporations sort of, you know, waving us a carrot, but there's a stick behind it. Thank you. I totally agree that we got to be careful. Okay, but um, can, can I say just really quick about yeah. the, so it'll be super quick. So then, so you say, um, so there are these risks, and they're actually known risks. Uh, and there's some unknown risks, of course. We can't talk about those, because what could they be? We don't know them. Uh, and one of the known risks is uh, increased blood pressure, so uh, I'll take beta blockers. And then, uh, you know, you get sleep rebound, so I'll take uh, Ambien. And now, of course, like, you can talk about, yeah, but what are the side effects of, I mean, so... And the, drug interactions. Sure, sure, I mean, okay, we can talk about drug interactions. And then, I mean, so long as I'm willing to, like, go along that line and buy all those risks, and in each of those stages, I think the cost-benefit analysis comes out fine, Maybe it means I have to take a, 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 a bigger cocktail, so to speak. And, and, you then, might, and you might need to take an additional medical insurance to cover for sure. the long-term consequences. That should, be our, that should be his choice. Sure. sure. I'll yeah. send you my argument, uh, our paper in an argument, uh, uh, argument in a paper, and we'll, we'll see that we agree that everyone has the right to sort of make that choice if they're sufficiently informed. Sure. Okay, but just, so just before you get to you, Chris. So... I still want to come back to a point that Christoph made, and that is that, you know, your, so the, w the way that you're pointing it, Thomas, is that you say, well, look, um, I'm quite happy to do this, and look, and a, and a whole bunch of transhumanists might be happy to do this, and I, and I can also see the, attra the attraction precisely of that. Well, look, if, if it has the following side effects, well, I'll take some beta blockers. Drug interactions, well, give me another, you know, drug to, um, to counteract that. And maybe, and maybe the residual side effects, I'm prepared to say, a shortening of 10 years of my, of my life? Sure, uh, I'll give up on that. Now, I am still worried about the question of what to say about people who now want to say, well, I, would, I really simply would prefer to opt out of this for, maybe for aesthetic reasons, maybe for, I don't really want to tell you what reasons. Um, should I, is it a fait accompli that what I ought to now say is, well, look, if you want to opt out, too bad for you. You know, don't come mm -hmm. crying poor to me when you, uh, when you sure. happen to be, yeah, it was mm -hmm. your choice, and thus, you know, suck eggs. Um, I don't actually think that that's what we ought to say. I think that what a, what a legal regime ought to do is to say something like, look, this is a, do we actually want to protect, uh, does society want to protect these kinds of decisions? and to give them substan uh, substantive uh, protection, not just formal protection. Yep, formally you can choose to opt out, and guess what, you're gonna be screwed. Or do we want to say, no, uh, we're going to protect your decision to opt out, and make sure that you are not disadvantaged by it. That's, uh, and I think it's, this is a substantive legal question, not, uh, not some formalism. Just, well, just, then, just very quick about the baseline, to go back yeah. to that. There are people who are already who are, let's just assume I do all this, to end up like I move myself further away from the baseline. 
And I end up getting myself even with people who are just, you know, for the grace of God, so to speak, already at that point on the continuum. And then, so, but what do we normally say? We normally say, I mean, you're saying, like, we say too bad. What we normally say is, to use the technical term, tough shit. Right, yeah, tough shit. Sorry, sorry you, were born, sorry you weren't born with a high IQ. Sorry you weren't born tall. Sorry you weren't born with a good memory. Sorry you weren't born with capacity to focus. Sorry you weren't, or sorry you were born average, or sorry you were born... But that's what we already, I mean, so in some sense, you're asking, like, what society do I want to endorse? And that's the society, in some sense, we already find ourselves in. And I think, well, that one's not so great either. So if we're looking at, like, it contrastively, I want to make sure we're comparing it with... Good. Yeah. And, and, that's, and that's exactly what, I, what, uh, what I'm in favor of, right? So yeah. the, the last, uh, I think, was actually Alex that made the point about, look, this is just one of the values, right? And I agree, it's just one of the values. Yeah. And that's why we should consider the other values and not just simply, you know, Say it's a fait accompli because some of the, some of the responses that I've had uh, to this uh, to the new normal talk have been things like, oh, um, it's inevitable. Really, it's not like a tornado. It ain't inevitable. It's a matter of you know we make legal rules. We make these drugs. We get to make certain choices, and so it's when you talk... an effort to not just be. Sorry. No, I was just going to uh, come back to when you talk about protecting people's rights or, or interests. Say. Uh, I think it's important to be specific about what we're talking about. So you could have a consistent position where you say there are certain things we really ought to protect with new regulations if necessary. Uh, if I can come back to the Amish, uh, so they are neoladites. They reject to various degrees most of modern technology. But, you know, they're still alive and well. Their communities are there. They are uh, living uh, pretty happy lives, for all I can tell. Uh, we don't come and say, you know, tell them, that's not right, you guys, you're crazy, you know, stop doing this now, it's time for computers and, and mobile phones and, and to live like civilized people. We, they've managed to preserve their communities, they can practice their religion, so and it would be wrong, obviously, if we curtail those rights. So we can agree that there's a, a right uh, for these people to practice their way of life and that there, there should be appropriate safeguards for that. But that's compatible with saying, uh, if, if you're not an Amish person and you want to become a, f a famous tenured professor, but without using, ever using the internet or a computer, and you can find a suitable university to accommodate you, I think it's consistent to say, well, in that case, it's not discrimination. It's not unacceptable to not have safeguards that are going to guarantee equal chances for the Amish person versus other. Candidates. Uh, Let me point out, because I think there's a tendency to think in, in terms of kind of the Amish are they going to be the ones who don't use these enhancers and that's kind of this strange group, you know, that doesn't drive. No, I mean, Mormons don't take this stuff. They're doing fine, you know? Uh, it's not like all of a sudden everybody who doesn't take it is going to lose out. I'm going to ask, take one more question because we're already ten, five or ten minutes over. So, Chris, one question. I would, uh, heavens. Um, one, two things. First, very quickly, it probably is worth mentioning for the children at home that the actual evidence base for any of these things having real world improvements in your performance essentially isn't there. At least it wasn't there two years ago when Nicole made me look for it. Um, I mean, it might have changed, but. Uh, one thing we do know is that uh, there's a study that says that you, may, you don't actually do any better, but boy, you feel like you're doing better, uh, which might account for for why they're popular. Um, my only question was, Nicole, because I'm already, I'm mandated as a doctor to do cognitive en enhancement. I've got to spend, and it's got, the side effect is 50 hours every year. Um, should, I, should I be saying to the medical board, listen, I've got an aesthetic objection to reading all those journals? Um, I think that that wouldn't be an unreasonable thing to do, actually. So, here, so, here's, so here's the, uh, the Nicole Vincent take on this. Um, I don't think that it's a fait accompli that what, that what we should put up with are really draconian uh, workplace conditions. Um, and I do think that, it's, that we have sacrificed uh, a fair bit, actually, in our society in terms of uh, just for the workspace. And again, I'm not endorsing the claim that therefore what we should do is to forego uh, your enhancement, or for that matter, to forego you doing a better job. You know, so now, don't worry, forget about having to uh, engage in continuing, legal, uh, continuing medical education. 
No, let's do that. But at the same time, let's think of how to do this in such a way that we don't create a society uh, that makes the rest of our lives simply enslaved to working. That's sort of the way in which I'm trying to frame this. So, you know, so in, in your particular case, well, yeah, let's make sure that you can do your continuing med medical education during some block of your day, which doesn't simply take up yet more of your family time, unless you want to. I mean, if you want to, well, maybe we should allow that, as long as it doesn't therefore mean that others uh, coerce you in a way uh, which um, we don't think you should be allowed to coerce them in. I'm going to the doctor that keeps up with the journals. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect that now is a good time to say let's finish up uh, for this session. Um, I thank my panel for their very intelligent comments and all of you. All right, so.